In this video, we're going to try and do something a little bit different to give a demonstration why the cross product of a curl is equal to zero. Or actually, this is the curl of a gradient. That's a gradient. This is the del operator, of course. And when you take the cross product of anything with the del operator, it's a curl. And this is a gradient. So we're taking the curl of the gradient. We want to prove it equals zero. Before we do that, let's reveal the del operator. If we have it operating on a scalar f, it produces a vector by taking partial derivatives with respect to x, y, and z, and then multiplying the partial derivatives by a unit vector. And this vector that is made from this partial differentiation process is called the gradient vector. And we could also express it like this, where y is x2, z is x3, the unit vector i is e1, the unit vector j is e2, and so forth. And if we express it like this, then we could write it in a condensed form like this. We have a repeated index, so we sum over that for 1, 2, and 3. We have this written as i, but this should be a 1. The unit vector e1 is the same thing as the unit i vector, just as the unit vector e2 is the same thing as the j vector. So this sums over j1, j2, and j3. So here's another way that we can express the gradient vector. Now, if we take this definition, partial with respect to xj, we'll just call that partial j. Then with that notation, the del operator, that's just partial j, ej. So if we have the del operator operating on a scalar f, it would be partial j, f, ej. So here we're taking partial derivatives of the scalar with respect to j, multiplying it by ej. And since we have a repeated index, that means we're summing. So we have the partial of f with respect to x1 times e1, plus the partial of f with respect to x2 times e2, plus the partial of f with respect to x3 times e3. So this is a more condensed way of writing the gradient vector. So we have those two results written up here. The del operator we can express like this, because with the del operator, all we're doing is taking partial derivatives, three of them. We're always operating for these videos anyway in three-dimensional space. And the del operator operating on a scalar f would be taking these partial derivatives and multiplying by the unit vector, summed over j equal 1, j equal 2, j equal 3, just like we did right here. Remembering that this means partial with respect to xj. So here's the notation that we're using. This. Now, our gradient vector, of course, that will have an i, j, and k component. A generic j component of our gradient vector, that would just be the partial of f, j. Because to get this, that would, of course, be this, the dot product of this, with the unit vector ej. Well, if I take the dot product of this with the unit vector ej, it just gives us this. So here we have the gradient vector. A generic component j would be equal to this expression. 
then analogously we could say, well, for our Dell operator, a generic J component would just be partial J. So here's the notation that we're going to be using. And to see how, let's say, let's remember how we write a cross product using the epsilon permutation symbol. So be epsilon C A times some unit vector, we call it I, then gave these indexes J and K, so you have epsilon J K I. Now suppose we have a curl where we have del operator cross A. So we have the same setup, epsilon J K I, and we can have here a jth component of the del operator, just like we had a jth component of the C vector, and a kth component of A that stays the same, times some unit vector EI. Remember what this is, this is just partial J. So we can write the curl like this, epsilon J K I partial J A sub K E I. And as you've noticed in our previous videos, we like to work um, in component form. So, for example, the ith component of this would just be epsilon j k i partial j a k. Because the ith component of this is just this dot the unit vector e i. Take the dot part here with e i, we just have this. So, here then would be the ith component of our curl written using the epsilon permutation symbol. Now, here we have the curl of the gradient. So it's going to be the same deal. Here we'll have multiplied by some unit vector, we call it i. So we'll have del, a jth component of it. Here's our gradient vector. We'll have a kth component of it. J, K, I, J, K, I. But remember, we our notation, this is the same thing as partial J, and the kth component of the gradient vector that's this. Remember from our previous page, we had a generic jth component of the gradient vector is this. So if we had a generic kth component, this would be k. So that means we can write the curl of the gradient using the epsilon permutation symbol would be partial J, and for this, partial KF times the unit vector EI, epsilon J, K, I. Now, again, for our problems, as you've noticed in the previous videos, we like to have them expressed in component form. So the ith component of this, of course, that would just be this dotted with the unit vector EI, which would be this dotted with the unit vector EI, but EI dot EI is just one, so the ith component is just epsilon J K I partial J partial K F. So we have the ith component of the curl of the gradient equals this expression. And again, in our previous videos, when we have a particular identity we're working with, we try to get it into component form, because when we have it in component form, on this side, we usually have a bunch of scalars that we're working with. And we can shuffle the scalars around, because the order in which you multiply them and add them together doesn't matter. So that's the advantage of having expressed in component form. 
Now here, we don't have scalars, we have partial derivatives. But notice that, what are we doing here? We have a scalar, we're taking its partial with respect to k, then we're taking its partial with respect to j. But of course, it doesn't matter which order we take the partial derivatives in, but it could be the other way around, and it would give us the same result. So, for our problem, We want to show this identity, and we have this expressed now in component form. Right here. So we have del cross del f, its ith component equals epsilon j, k, i, partial j, partial k, and we have a scalar, f. Now, notice that this, that's the same thing as minus epsilon kji. Because you move this over once, that's a, a, an odd number per, per mutation. One is an odd number. So this now has a minus sign. So we can rewrite this like this. We can say, well, be equal to minus epsilon kji but now these indexes have to match. So we'd have partial k, partial j, f. And on this side, this is a valid step because we have a scalar. We're taking its partial with respect to k, then respect to j. Here we're taking it with respect to j, then with respect to k. It comes out the same either way. But now here, is where we're going to do something different. Once we have this in component form, showing this to be true only requires about three steps. But the next step we're going to take is different. So we want to remind ourselves that when you have these double indexes, meaning that you're summing over them, um, in many textbooks you see they call them dummy indexes. For example, we could say, well, a vector x that can be expressed like this. Say x sub l e sub l. And that just means double indexes, we sum over them for x1 e1 plus x2 e2 plus x3 E3. Now suppose I just arbitrarily change these. So I wasn't calling it LL, we called it ZZ. What matter means the same thing. Or suppose we called it DD. Again, what matter means the same thing. So that's why when you have these double indexes, meaning that you're added summing over them, they call them dummy indexes, because it doesn't matter what they are, it always means the same thing. Well here, we have double index, k and j. So we can change these, as long as once we make the change, we're consistent about it. And here's how we're going to make the change. We're going to relabel so that k is j. And we're going to relabel so that what was j becomes k. So with that, that will equal 
epsilon, this is k, that changes to j, that's a relabel. j, that gets relabeled as k. And then we have i. This minus sign comes down because this epsilon permutation symbol we derive from this one not by permuting it but by relabeling the indexes. So whatever sign this has comes along with it. This is not a permutation. This is a relabeling. Then we have partial j partial k f. So we relabeled the indexes. Notice it means exactly the same thing. This is going to be 1, 2, and 3. This is going to be 1, 2, and 3. This is going to be 1, 2, and 3. This is going to be 1, 2, and 3. It's the same thing. But what that means then is, by doing this little trick, we have an expression saying that this epsilon jki with respect to j, partial with respect to k, f equals minus that. Well, the only way something can equal its negative is if it's zero. So this implies that epsilon j, k, i partial with respect to j partial k f equals zero. So this equals zero. That means then that this equals zero. So we have del dot del cross del f the curl of the gradient ith component equals zero. Let's multiply both sides of the equation by EI. So this tells us then del cross del f the vector. Summing over all these gives us the vector equals zero. And there's our proof. So here, it wasn't long. We just simply had one, two steps to prove this. But the trick was in relabeling the indexes. And sometimes you will see that being used in various identity problems. So we chose this problem to demonstrate that. And I think that will finish off the video. Um, let's see, I think this is video number 14 in the uh, series where we're dealing with the super powerful uh, vector identity technique. And the, uh, the playlist for all of the videos is at the website digital-university.org.